Yep, ready to go. Ready to go? Right. Welcome, guys. I can see there are quite a few there in Zoom. Welcome to the a new series, which um, is going to be based on astrology, of course, as you know by the title. And why am I interjecting that in the middle of the series that I was doing on languages? Well, because I have a great friend who's come to visit, Oscar Aragon. You've seen probably saw the lives I did with him playing the guitar and um, he's teaching me some of his great techniques and theory and um, he wants me to teach him astrology because he, he's uh, a keen student of astrology. He knows a lot but he wants to know how to be an astrologer. So I thought while he's here now I'll begin that and then we'll do the last three in the series of languages after astrology is finished. So I'm going to go all the way through seven series, seven um, lectures in the series and by the time we get to the seventh you will be a competent astrologer. Now this all depends on your acuteness and intention and the level of concentration and intent that you put into it. All right, so uh, I would recommend have, some, have a pen and paper just for some notes. Um, I would also recommend that you really, really turn off all distractions because this first uh, lecture is the most important. It's the foundation. And people don't know what the foundation is out there in astrology world. They, they wouldn't know where to begin. They start with, oh, that planet's called Saturn. And they point to that. And, and it's just a symbol, you know. I mean, what does, what, where is it in relation to us on the Earth? And, and what is this circle I'm looking at called a natal chart? So what we're going to do is we're going to understand exactly what the natal chart is. And you can only understand that when you know that the Earth is a stationary horizontal plane. And astrology proves that because the intersecting horizontal line in the middle of the circle of the natal wheel is the Earth. Bonatti, a 12th century astrologer, Sounds like Bonacci, but only it's two T's, Bonatti. Um, he said that that line was called the line of truth or the line of the earth. So let's begin with that line, shall we? First of all, if I share my screen, we're going to have a look at where I'm going to begin. Uh, I need to be able, enabled. Good. So, we're finished with that, haven't we? All right, so here's my chart, guys. You're going to be familiar with this. And I'm going to include a reading of my chart. So, because you guys know me. I don't know, I haven't spent much time with a lot of you guys, right? You know that. So, uh, I mean, I could read your chart and I would know a lot about you, but you already know a lot about me. So you would be wondering, look at all these planets in the seventh house, man. I mean, what does that, how does that make sense? You know, look at Mars and the North Node in the twelfth house. You know, what's that... Uh, dynamic doing in Santos's constitution. Look at this, he's got Uranus and Pluto rising in the first house. Well, all these things will start to make sense and you'll see this picture, this is me. But this line here from the AC to the DC, AC, DC, is called the line of the earth and it never changes, you see. Now, because I'm using a Placidus house system, you can see here the word Placidus. Take note. Placidus is a house system. There are many house systems. Let's have a look at some. So house system. In this box you will see there's Placidus, 
Koch, Campanus, Regimontanus, Equal, Equal Mid Heaven, Bell Hall, Hull House, etc., etc. And also there should be, yes, Porphyry, my favourite Neoplatonic astrologer. So if I click on that, you will see that it will be slightly different. Yep. Well, now you see that my son is in the eighth house and there's not so many planets uh, populating the seventh house. So knowing that he was one of the best astrologers who lived, I would, I would use this in conjunction with Placidus. Placidus is a house system which is unequal. So you can see, for instance, that this house here is like about 40, 45 degrees, whereas this one's only about, uh, if you compare it with the sign Gemini that it's in, you can see that Gemini is a total of 30 degrees, but this cusp here and this cusp here are inside of the sign, so they're only, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Okay. okay. And I'm echoing. So, right. So you can see it's only 25 degrees. It's not equal. If we go back here and get an equal house system, well, now all of the houses are now 30 degrees. All right. And if you and, and you'll notice that. I still have Leo on the 17th degree of uh, uh, my, um, the ascendant is still on in Leo 17 degrees. But if I went whole house, now what happens is whole signs is that the signs now match the houses. So the, the, my first rising sign Leo with the ascendant still in 17 degrees, now it has to fit perfectly the houses. This is the only system which exists, okay, whole signs, and you'll see it here if you use um, this uh, website that I'm using. I'm going to teach you how to use Astrodyne's, okay, so we're going to be using this. So. So, I do not use this system. A lot of uh, astrologers do. You can see now my son is in the ninth house, right? So that's moved considerably. Now, I could get an accurate reading from this as well. There's, there's no doubt about that. I could. Um, but I find that Placidus is always uncannily, just always way, way more... Um, it's the default system, in, uh, house system, in uh, pretty much every uh, astrological website there is. And you'll see the other default system is um, tropical. Sidereal is in here as well, but it defaults to Placidus, always, and tropical. All right? So... That was a bit of a diversion to show you why the cusps of the houses are not aligned with the cusps of the signs and why the houses are not equal, right? So you can see my MC is over to the left. It's not This is the midday point, you know. Why isn't it directly up here at 12 o'clock? Well, this is a 24-hour clock, guys. And the AC is 6 a.m. in the morning, and opposite the DC is 6 p.m. In general, I mean, just um, generally speaking, okay? Because it varies depending on the latitude you're in and the season, or, and the signs that are rising as well. Um, so you're good. we're going to understand why the MC is over here to the left by the time we're finished. All right, so that was just a diversion away from this line here. We're going to start with this line here, which is the line of truth. This is the earth. Because 
You see here, there's the Sun, there's Jupiter, there's Mercury, there's the Moon, Chiron, Venus, Saturn, Neptune, Lilith, Pluto, Uranus, Mars, North Node. Where's the Earth? Now, if the Earth were a planet spinning and rotating and revolving, it would be in there amongst those planets. But there's no Earth. Because those planets are turning clockwise every 24 hours. As I said, this is a 24-hour clock which turns clockwise clockwise every day. So, although the signs are going in the other direction, there's the first sign, Aries, red fire, and there's Taurus, green earth, Gemini air, Cancer water. You can see the signs are going counterclockwise, and these planets are also yearly travelling counterclockwise through the ecliptic. This here is the ecliptic, right where my cursor is. Here is the ecliptic, dividing the signs on the outside, or separating rather, the signs on the outside and the houses on the inside. So, my sun, for instance, you can see it's right there, three degrees Aries. It's right here. But, so it's essentially located in Aries, but it is accidentally located in the seventh house. If I were born two hours later, my son would probably be in the sixth house about here. And Aries would have come down as well, because this whole sky moves. This is the sky. This is the zodiac belt here. That's the zodiac belt. And then this here is the ecliptic. This line here in the middle. Separating the zodiac belt from the houses. And we have an unequal house system. It's very important for you to understand that right now. Alright? So, you don't get confused because you can see they're not all the same size and it might just cause, at the, initially, some confusion. So, cast that aside, we could easily start with um, a whole sign or equal house system, but this, this, this will do the trick because we're going to learn from the very, very beginning how to do astrology. So let's go uh, to my board and we'll start with that line, the line of the earth, the line of truth. <clears throat> Alright, AC is over here, DC is over here. Now, the circle that I said divided the signs from the houses, that is the ecliptic. This is the ecliptic, guys, and that is the beginning of astrology. This is where you begin your, your journey. Always understand that this is the ecliptic. What is the ecliptic? The ecliptic is the path, the trajectory of the sun. All the other planets also follow the ecliptic, but they're not always on the ecliptic. So if this, if this were the, the sun's journey in the sky, let's imagine these are snapshots of the sun during the day. And we took time-lapse shots. These are all half-hour intervals through the day. And we see, that's, well, that's the ecliptic. Then, then at night, the moon, the moon can be five and a half degrees positive declination. This is called declination. This is called right ascension of meridian. So, when you, when you face south in the morning, you'll see the sun rising in the east over here. And you'll see it here at midday. And it will always set on that angle 
backslash to your right. So you're sitting on an island here, there you are, and you're looking south. You'll see this every morning. That's the ecliptic. This is the ecliptic. Okay? The houses, the signs of the zodiac are around that. Because the ecliptic, the zodiac belt is 18 and a half degrees. No, it's actually 18 degrees wide, the zodiac belt. And every sign is 30, 30 degrees long. So let's say that's Aries. The zodiac belt from here to here is 18 degrees. Take note of that number. Interesting. Some say it's 17, some say it's 16, but it is 18 degrees wide. And the ecliptic, the ecliptic runs through here. You know, it, it just zigzags through the signs, but it's always within those 80, 18 degrees. So the ecliptic is the most important thing that we must concentrate on. Because tropical astrology is ecliptic science. And when you see this 24 hour clock, the sun is doing this every day, because the whole, the whole heavens, the zodiac belt is turning clockwise every day, even though the signs go the other way, and even though yearly they're slowly going through the ecliptic this way, the moon will do 13 degrees every day, the sun does one degree every day. Going this way. Pluto takes 250 years to go around and come back to the same spot. But all, everything yearly is going counterclockwise. Everything daily is rotating over the flat earth clockwise. Daily clockwise. Yearly counterclockwise. Okay? So here on the outside we put the zodiac belt. Is that what the 18 degrees was? Yeah. That's the zodiac belt. The zodiac belt is 18 degrees wide. Yeah. And every sign is 13, 30 degrees long. Right? So it has to be. Let's get this done. They're all 30 degrees, every sign, perfectly. I mean, I'm obviously going to be a little bit out here, guys, but... But the signs must be 30 degrees. Even though Virgo, Virgo is a very long sign. Virgo takes up about that much. It's a very long sign. And Aries, Aries is very short. It's only about... 23 degrees. It's a very short sign. Because, see, this, this shows you that astrology is not sidereal. It's tropical. It's based on the ecliptic. So there are two zodiacs. Please understand. There are two zodiacs. There's the zodiac on the ecliptic, which is closer to us, and then there's the zodiac of the constellations, which is 18 degrees wide, in the firmament further away. So the lack of understanding this is what causes a lot of people to doubt the accuracy of astrology because they can see... At, at night, for instance, we had a full moon in Sagittarius. Well, I, I looked at the full moon, and Sagittarius was over there, and it was actually um, really in, um, in uh, Libra. Uh, sorry, in, uh, in Scorpio, Libra. Libra was near there. But it was 
it physically, astronomically, it was not a Sagittarius, Sagittarius full moon. So people say, oh, well, see, this is confusing. It's, it's wrong. No, it's not. Because on the ecliptic, the moon was in Sagittarius. This is an ecliptic science. Tropical astrology is an ecliptic science. That's why it, in the Sam Best method, the E in best is ecliptic. Ecliptic sine wave toroidal field method. Ecliptic. The ecliptic is the most important word in your vocabulary when it comes to astrology. The ecliptic. So we saw that beautiful Sagittarius moon, but it wasn't in Sagittarius, it was in Scorpio. Today it's entered Sagittarius in sidereal, but in tropical it's in Capricorn. Let me just check that before I make a mistake. Let's see, where's the moon today? Yep, just into the Capricorn. Okay. All right. So, the moon, it can be five and a half degrees positive declination. Which means it won't always be on the ecliptic, and then it can be five and a half degrees south declination. Negative. Five and a half degrees is the most it can decline, declinate or decline, from the ecliptic of the sun. Mars can go out way more, and Pluto. Mars and Pluto have big declinations. So they can be, you know, they can go way out of the zodiac belt. You know, they can go out here. But the sun is, the sun definitely is always in that 18 degree belt. The sun's ecliptic. The sun never goes outside of those 18 degrees. Because it, it suffers, it, it suffers no de declination. It is always only right ascending. Right ascension of meridian, the ram. Right ascension of meridian. This is, this is right ascension of meridian. As the sun comes up in the morning in the east, this is the rising here. Your rising sign will be here. It will do 15 degrees every hour. One hour two hours. So here we have 12 midday, here we have 6 a.m. So this will be seven. If we put the houses in, let's put the houses in. Let's do them as equal as possible. This, this here is seven o'clock. The sun will be there. If you're born at seven o'clock, the sun will be there in the 12th house. Houses, remember, they go around this, this way as well. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So, when someone says to me, um, I'm a Sagittarian and I was born at six o'clock in the morning, well, I know that they're a double Sagittarian. Because their sun will be here at six o'clock. And... Sagittarius will be here as well. That means they've got sun in Sagittarius and rising sign in Sagittarius. Only people who are born between 5, 6, 7, 8 a.m. in the morning around that give or take an hour each side of 6 o'clock in the morning. Only those people will have the same rising sign as their sun sign. Okay? So, this will be 8 o'clock, this is 9, 10, 11, midday, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3, 4, I was born at 4, 4 p.m. And you saw my son was right there in the 7th house. You saw that before. 
because it's a 24 hour clock. Okay. So that you can you can also tell when, when someone says to you, oh, "I was born at um, I was born at midday." Well, you know that they've probably got their son in the tenth house, the house of Korea, because you know you know where twelve o'clock is, so you know roughly which house it's going to be in. You always look at this as a clock, a military clock, always. Five o'clock, six o'clock, seven, eight p.m., nine, ten, eleven, midnight, one a.m., two a.m., three, four, five, six a.m. There's your military clock, and the sun is going through here, through the ecliptic, and all the planets are following at different speeds, but they're not all on the ecliptic. They're all right ascending. You see. You ascend, the sun ascends to the right, right ascension, right ascension of meridian. Okay, so when you're looking for coordinate, when you're looking for a star and you punch in the coordinates when you're on a website, when you go to Google Maps, for instance, you, you need to know the coordinates of the earth, the latitude and the longitude. You know, if you want to say, all right, where's, where's Hawaii? What, what latitude is Hawaii? I did this yesterday reading someone's chart. Well, it's 21 degrees latitude. And here in Cancun, we're at 22. So Hawaii, I know, we know that Hawaii and Puerto Morelos, where we live here, is virtually on the same latitude. Well, that's called declination in the sky. Latitude is declination. Longitude the longitudinal lines on the Earth, which are separated by 15 degrees each, they are right ascension of meridian because the sun has to ascend in the east. It ascends to the right. Okay? The ram of God, Ra. Ra is the sun radiating. So it's all appropriate, it all ties in. So now we know that we have a fixed centre here, a fixed place to work from. This is the earth, the line of the earth. Now this circle here, we know that it doesn't go up and under the earth. You have to flip it like this. So you have to grab that and grab this and do this. Are you following me? So let's say the top of my marker is the top of the ecliptic there and this blue part here is the bottom of the ecliptic there. What you have to envisage with your eyes is this. All right? And then you'll realise that this circle is actually going around like this clockwise over stationary earth. Let's have a look at that, sharing my screen. Okay. So, can you see here guys the ecliptic on this earth, which is in a globe model? There's the ecliptic. It starts at the equator here, March 21st. It goes up to the Tropic of Cancer. This line here is the Tropic of Cancer here. That curved line. You can see the latitude lines going straight down. Sorry, longitude, longitude. And the latitude lines are these ones. So really the equator is a latitude. All right? It's zero latitude. It's zero degrees. It, it's the equator equaling the northern and separating the southern hemisphere. And there's the ecliptic there, that sine wave. This is the most important thing for you to understand, this ecliptic. This is the mystery of all mysteries. This is the secret of all secrets. Walter Russell said, if you want to understand the universe, the secret of, of creation is in the wave. And this is the wave. All right, so let's have a look at it here. And this is how it really works. 
So the North Pole is in the centre here. Here is the equator. Here is the Tropic of Cancer on the inside. And here is the Tropic of Capricorn on the outside, the outer ring. And the Sun is going like this, clockwise, over the Earth. So let's say you're over here in New York, right here. All right? Now you know that the Sun only travels inside the tropics. Here is December, Capricorn. Here is where we are now, June, coming 15, in six days we're going to hit, no, no, here, sorry, at Cancer. Here we are now, right now, in, in six days time on the 21st of June, we're going to hit this point and then the sun has to return and go back and that will be Libra, it'll go through Libra on its way down to Capricorn here. And then from Capricorn there, it goes back up through Aries. Aries and Libra are on the equator. Cancer is over here, and Capricorn is over here. So the sun is going like this every year. Up and down. In Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bible of the East, it says that Ram... Sri Ram, the sun, Rama, R-A-M, is going on a ramp. It climbs from the Tropic of Capricorn, it climbs up to the Tropic of Cancer, like on a ramp. And I think I do have a chart here which shows that. Uh, let me see. Let's see if we can find one. Yeah, there it is. So, here is the Tropic of Capricorn down the bottom, and this is the ramp. It climbs up this ramp, climbs up to Cancer, June the 21st. And then it climbs back down. And here you see this is Libra, September 23rd, the equinox. And they've put March over here on, on the left. The other equinox. So it says that the sun, Rama, climbs a ramp as it ramps up to Cap Cancer. And that's why the people here in Scandinavia, right in the North Pole, that's why they can see a 24-hour uh, they have a 24-hour day. And they see this circle, they see the sun circling, circling around them in the sky, around the mount mountains, you know, or on the horizon. It, it goes right around the horizon. It doesn't go under the horizon. It, that lasts for about four or five days every year only around June the 21st at the solstice. So that's the ramp that the sun is climbing. Okay, so let's go back to my screen. Now, clean this board up a little bit. So, we have the line of the earth, the line of truth. And this is the south, and this is the north, guys. Why is that? Well, remember, where I, where I pointed out to you, and I'll share the screen again, actually, because it's, it's, this is too important. Uh, let's say, so let's say, So, um, okay, you're over here in New York. South is out, this is the 
Antarctica, this is the south and the north is in the middle. So if you're here in New York and you want to see the action of the sun, which is always between these two tropics, which way do you face? Well, you have to face south. You have to look southward. You can't, you can't look in this direction to the centre, north. If you go north, the sun will be behind your head over here. You won't, you won't see anything. You must be looking south. That's why many astrologers get confused. They often ask me, why is the south up here? Isn't the north always on top? Well, no, because when you get this ecliptic and you turn it up like that and you realise it's going around like this over the flat earth, well, from your perspective, it's just going up like this. But it's actually just going around and that's how light, light, the light show of the heavens works. It looks like the sun's just going like that, but it's actually circling. You can, uh, you can test that with cameras. So that's why this is the south and this is the east and this is the west. It's totally different. You know, when, when, they, um, when they teach you at school, they go, this is the north, this is the east, this is the south and this is the west, isn't it? And, then, and this, is, this works, this is, this, is, this is also good, there's no problem with this, that this is entirely workable. I grew up saying, never eat soggy wheat mix. Uh, we what? We always said never eat soggy waffles. <laughs> never eat soggy waffles. There you go. <laughs> Do you know what wheat mix are? No. Oh, you don't get them? In Australia we have wheat mix. No, we don't never eat shredded wheat. Never eat shredded wheat. There you go. But see, now in astrology, in astrology, the chart has these two flipped. That's the south, that's the north. This is the east, and this is the west. And you might be thinking, well, hey, wait a minute, you already confused me. Well, what's going on? Well, the secret, you can only understand this when you know that we're, we're dealing with a stationary earth here. This is a stationary earth and this is the ecliptic going clockwise around us every day. That's the only way you can understand why this is the south. Because in Australia where I grew up, if I wanted to watch the sun rise, I had to face north. And the sun didn't come up in the east, it came, uh, uh, um, sorry, it, it came up in the east, but the east was not on my left, it was on my right. In Australia, the sun goes like this, rises to your right, and it goes up, and it sets, forward slash. The first time in 2001 that I ever... I went to America, I, w I was on Venice Beach, California, uh, Los Angeles, I watched the sunset and then I, I saw the sunset like this for the first time. I've never seen that, I've always watched the sun setting like this in Australia. You see it in the high in the sky and you always see it doing this. And it's a north, and you have to face the north. But you see, over here, you you will see the sun do this setting in the afternoon, like this backslash, because you, we are in the northern hemisphere. I'm in Mexico, in the northern hemisphere way above Ecuador. Anyone that's above Ecuador, that line, the equator, has to face south to see this. I'm going to labour this. I'm really going to labour this because this is the foundation of astrology. 
This is a natural system. You see, in the Indian system where they do their, their houses like this, like a box, then they go like this, and then they have their um, houses like that, I think it is. And uh, how do they do it? First house. Now let me just check the uh, Indian system and I'll show you how much way more difficult house system inside aerial. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so they've got... Yeah, I got that right. And then they do this. Yeah, they've got... Uh, this goes straight through there and this goes straight through there. That's their house system. And this is the first house, this is the second, third, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh. Uh -huh. I don't want to confuse you. Let's do this again. So they have a box. This is how absurd. I think this system is so absurd. And there's no ecliptic. <laughs> They've just got this box. And there's no ecliptic. Here we have the circle and we have the ecliptic. Right, can you see my screen? Is everyone seeing my screen? I mean my uh, yeah. board? Yeah. Board, yeah, good, okay. Now let me just get this right. Okay, so, smile out. This is their house system inside the real. Is that all I do? Yes. Oh, are they watching through there? Yeah, they on Zoom. That's how they go through. Oh, okay. Academy is through. Okay. So we've got this perfect, perfect tropical system with the ecliptic on it. Where's their ecliptic? This is their first house. This is their second, third, four, fifth. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 house. It goes in the same order as ours, but how does that make any sense? This, to me, is honky, shonky, hocus, pocus, dodgy, bodgy, bogus pseudoscience. I'm sure the Jesuits taught them this, because this, this is the only thing that makes... Where's the ecliptic? And then they put the sun here in the first house, well, which degree is it in? This, there's no degrees. And, oh, your sun is, is squared Mars in the seventh house. Well, how the frickin' hell, what, how do you know? And which degree is it in? You see, they don't, want to, they don't want to give you the degrees because if they start giving you degrees, then you'll start working out that they're giving you degrees along the ecliptic. And then you'll work out... <laughs> OK, let's ignore the constellations that are sidereally displacing or processing and let's focus on the ecliptic as Thomas H. Burgoyne said astrology is a science based on the ecliptic on the sun and the degree in which it's on on the ecliptic all right so <laughs> What is that? You know, I mean, I look at their, their thing and I just laugh at that. They're, they're missing so much information. We have the signs on the outside, so you know which sign is, is there. I mean, they tell you, oh, here is uh, Sagittarius is over here. Well, how the frickin' hell do you know? It's just a box. What is this? It's like kindergarten. Here you've got science, like a billion times more information than what they give you. A billion. You know, you have the houses compared to the signs, you have the, the planets exactly on which degree of the ecliptic. You've got everything here. It's just a pure, it's pure richness. So, going back to Australia, remember, you guys always see a backslash sunset. I grew up seeing a forward slash sunset. So when I was on Venice Beach and I saw that, 
that was a turning point for me. It was a turning point for me. And I really started to focus on the ecliptic. And it was only six years after that, 2007, when I woke up. And, I mean, I was studying astrology in the, in the 90s, even though I was a Jehovah's Witness. I was reading astrological books and, and learning about all this ecliptic stuff. Um, but it dawned on me. When I, saw, when I saw the sun going down, I just thought, this is amazing. It intoxicated me to see the sun uh, setting in a backslash as astrology has it, because this is a northern hemisphere-centred science. This science is centred in the northern... It has to be. It simply has to be. Okay? So, in, in the lectures down the track, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see how that affects people who are born in the southern hemisphere, like me. We're going to see how to um, understand you know, that a bit deeper. So we'll get to that. But always remember, this is always going to be south, no matter whether you are in Australia or in, in North America. Or should I say, no matter, with, no matter whether you are in the Southern Hemisphere or the Northern Hemisphere, this in astrology, the MC is the south and always will be. Because you're standing on the earth, here, this is you, and you're looking, you have to look south to see the sun between the tropics on the ecliptic, to see this and to see it set. You're standing there, you're watching, you're on Venice Beach, and you're watching this, four o'clock, five o'clock, Sun sets at six o'clock, bang, it's gone. Now, this, this here is called, bon Bonatti calls this under the earth. Oh, hang on a minute. Under the earth? So everything below this line is called under the earth. Uh-oh. We flat earthers now have a problem, don't we? No, we don't. Because the earth is... The earth is the horizon. It's, it's under the horizon. See, when the vanishing point, the earth and the atmosphere, when the sun goes like this and it disappears and it goes under the earth, the earth is, was known as the line that extends forever horizontally. The line that extends forever horizontally. So when it goes under that line, it doesn't literally go under that line. To your eyes it goes under the line. That's why it's called under the earth, because it's gone under that line. It vanishes. And because, because that vanishing point always happens on the horizon, it gives you the illusion, the impression that it is actually going under, physically. But it's not, it's going away. For instance, if you're on a flat, flat road and your friend starts walking away from, away from you, when he's a mile away, you'll see his legs disappear first. You say, I can't see his legs anymore. And then his head will go under and you see, he's still on the road. It's flat for six miles, but he disappears in that vanishing point and his head, and the last thing you see is his head going down. And yet that road is flat. And he's gone under the road. He has. Not physically. It's to your eye. You can do this on a flat table, guys. You can experiment with it. Get, it, get a little ball and roll it down the table. Push it. Right, long, long, flat, level, level, level tap, push it, and you will see that it will disappear. A little marble. It will disappear and it will go under the table. And yet it's still rolling on the table. If you get a table long enough. Okay? That's why this is called under the earth. Because you're gonna you're gonna meet these terms. Astrologers will be 
arguing these against you, saying, oh, well, how come the ancient astrologers said that this, all of this in here, the night time, all of this is called under the earth? Well, hang on. They're not thinking, are they? Because in their system, the sun is here. So they've got the sun here, this green thing. And here's the earth. And the earth's going like that around the sun. So when does the sun go under the earth? I, 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 thought, I thought that the earth was going like this. Right? So the earth is going like this around the sun. And they're arguing that this, the sun is going under the earth. Well, show me, Mr. Globy, in your model, right? Show me how, in astrology, if you're a globy, how the sun goes under the earth. They're level with each other. Nothing goes under anything. But then they'll say, oh yeah, but it's from your, your vantage point because you're standing on a, on a ball and as the sun goes down, it goes under your feet. You know, they say if you dig a hole long enough, you'll end up in China, right? <laughs> We, we learned that at school. <laughs> so they, then they'll argue that. But then you can come back to them and say, all right, okay, all right, you want to you really do pseudoscience, um, you know, um, to the extreme. Well, then how does that get to be the south then? When, when the sun is up, high in the sky, how is it, how in the hell can it be in the south? Because, all right, so here's, here's, here's the sun and here's the earth rotating every day, all right? So when, when, when you when you come to this point, that's the morning, if that's the sun, as the, as the earth is turning in the globe model, this is the morning, this is midday, and this side over here is sunset, right? Right, so... If, if that's the south, which it is in astrology, well... That means the sun would have to be down here, <laughs> below. So the only way you can understand this is to understand that this line here is the earth. It's the only, it's called the line of truth because it never moves from the east to the west, from the ascendant to the descendant. And it's a 24 hour clock and this is the ecliptic going around every day whilst they're travelling through that ecliptic counterclockwise yearly. So, let's, let's um, explain it this way. Counterclockwise yearly. So, I'm hearing something coming. Oh, okay. So, this is me with my son on the third degree of Aries. If I were born the next day at the same time, my son would be on the fourth degree of Aries, but it, the sun would have gone around like this. Right? I was born on the 24th of March. So on the 25th of March, the sun will be on the fourth degree of Aries, and it will have gone one degree that way. Then on the 26th of March, it will be on the 6th degree of, Mar of Aries. Then on the 27th of March, it will be on the 6th uh, 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 degree of Aries. And every day it progresses a degree. So it's travelling a degree that way, yearly, but every day it's going around as a 24-hour clock. All right, so let's advance from that point now. We're going to...
going to the next level of understanding. So that's the most important thing for you to understand. So we have the line of the earth. And this is the ecliptic. Okay. And here we have the south, and this is the north, which is called the IC, Imum Coelum, Imun, I think it's an M or an N, I think it's Imun, Coelum, and Medio Coelum, Medium. Medium. Oops. The middle of the heavens. Kaelum is. Let's see the spelling on that. I am U M. I am U M. Yes. With an M, is it? Yeah, I am. Okay. And then how do you spell this? Kaelum. C O E L I. Ha ha. I thought it was looking bad. I am. Uh, no, it should end with an M. Imum Koeli. Is that right? Let me just get that. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's Koeli. <laughs> what am I confusing this with? Wow. Well, How did I get that one wrong? Coeli. Well, Coeli is the chairly, the ceiling. The word ceiling comes from that. Can you see that? The ceiling. In, in French, heaven is ciel. And in English, the ceiling is the roof of your... So that's heaven. And you can see it right there. C-I-E-L. Right? So this is imum koelum. Let's see what the meaning of that is too. That would be handy. Meaning. Bottom. I see. Bottom of the sky. Yeah, okay. So this means bottom of the sky. So, yeah, I don't know why I put that there, but anyway, okay, Koeli. So, very important that you can see the word ceiling heaven there, okay? Cielo. Bottom of the heaven, and, and, it has to be, and it happens to be north. So, again, when, we, we talk, when we're talking about the globe model, they always say, this is, what pole is that? If these are the two poles, right? What do they call that? The North Pole. The South Pole's at the bottom, Australia's down here, North America's up here, they always call, they say, oh, you, you come from the land down under, come from the land down under, <laughs> yeah. So, you see how confused even astrologers are? Even astrologers are confused. How can they, how can they ever possibly think that, um, they also believe that the moon is a rock and, and things like that and, and the <laughs> that the earth is a globe and etc etc it's just it's astounding you know astrology only confirms the stationary horizontal plane earth that we live on you know it it only does that the more you learn the more you understand and and you will by the time we're finished all right so that's Medium Coeli, is that how that was spelled, guys? Did you check that as well? Let me check that. Because I don't want to... Uh, yeah, Medium. Medium Coeli. Okay, MC. Yes. Just shorten it for MC anyway, okay? So you, you already know that. AC. DC. I see an MC. Now, 
A third century Neoplatonist called Zosimos, he said that the name Adam is on the astrological chart. A D I M. He said this is the first letter of Adam's name. This is the second letter of Adam's name. This is the third, and that's the final letter. This we're all children of Adam. Because we are all children of this electromagnetic table. Let's call it a schematic, a blueprint. We're all children of this Adamic blueprint. A C M C D C I C. These are the most important angles. You see? In astrology, these are the strongest point. This is the strongest. This is the second strongest. This is the third strongest. This is the fourth strongest. That's why the houses that follow them are always the best houses. If someone has the sun in the first house, oh my, my. Like, these guys have big careers if they've got the sun in the... 10th house, this is the career house, this is the personality, so they've got a bright personality. This is their home life, and this is how they treat their partners. But these are called the angles. These, the first house, the fourth house, uh, the seventh house, and the tenth house. These are always, astrologers always look to these houses first, especially these two, because this is the strongest point, and this is the strongest. This one is so strong that it actually indicates the, the sign that is in here, the sign, mine is Leo, it's, it's so strong, this point, that it actually forms the shape of your body and you can see the look of that animal in the individual, the rising sign. If you look closely at me, you'll see you will see the lion or the, the you know like a, a cheetah or, or some cat, a feline. You will see it. You, if you know what you're looking for. I see you smiling because you I'm How do sure. you see a fish in someone? Huh? How, how do you see a fish in somebody? Well you, you what you see is their eye Piscean eyes, they're, they're over here. Because a fish has eyes to the side. Even Sagittarians, the horse has eyes to the side, right? Kind of thing. They don't have eyes like this. So you see Sagittarians and Pisceans, their eyes are more out like that, whereas the, the Saturnians, Capricorns and Aquarius, their eyes are more in like this. They're very close. Very, very close. The Pisceans have got very wide eyes out, like the fish. So, so you won't actually see a fish, but you'll see, you'll see the electromagnetic archetype. Right? So, so I'm a combination of Aries and my rising sign. That's how strong this point is. This, these are called the angles. Okay, guys? The angles. Astrologers always look first here. This tells them the most about the individual. Then what sort of a life path they will have, a journey, career. What sort of a home life, you know, whether they're going to be sort of homeless or poor. This will indicate wealth as well. And this is how they treat others. So this, these are the most telling, the angles, the four angles. All right? They're also called the cardines. Uh, the next houses are called um, succident. Because they, they succeed or they come behind the angles. So the angles are the most important. Yeah. Most astrologers, they do, they do a whole reading based on these two houses. According to the ancient astrologers, they said you can tell more about an individual by looking at these two houses than anything else. The strongest, the second strongest. And then these houses here, the third ones of each quadrant, the first house is always strong, called a cardine or an angle. Then the succinct house is medium strength. And the, the third one's a cadent. They're called cadent. 
And cadent means decadent. Decadent, to fall. These are weak. So if you've got a lot of planets in these weak ones, let's say you've got two planets over here, three in this house, one in the ninth, and another three over here, in, in all these cadent houses, you, you, it's more than likely that you're going to have a lot of problems in life <laughs> because they are very weak houses. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself with the houses. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to jump on that. I just wanted to explain how that cross is the most important cross, okay? From the AC to the DC, MC to the IC. East, west, south and north. Now you can explain to your friends and you know how astrology supports the um, stationary flat earth. All right, let us proceed. So, I will draw another one. Medium Coeli. smaller so I put more information on there, more writing. Alright, so we've got our most holy cross, AC, MC, DC and IC, Adam. We are the children of Adam. Everyone has one of these. Alright, so The signs, the constellations, are beyond the ecliptic. So we could, we could do it this way. I mean, that's how most of the uh, astrological charts on the, on the net do it. So we know that the planets are on the ecliptic and they're in the zodiac belt and they're all going around this way every day. And so the time you were born is crucial because the houses are sitting here waiting. They never move. Never, ever, ever move. The first house is always there in astrology. It's never over here. It's always there. The second house is always over here. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. 11, 12. So, audience participation. Let's say someone's born at 5 pm. Where will their son be? Which house? Sorry? No? Nope. Remember, this is midday. 5 pm. 5 pm. Huh? Exactly. That's 5 p.m. there. Remember, this is 6 p.m., 12 p.m., 12 a.m., 6 a.m. All right, so there's the sun on the ecliptic. The individual was born at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And he's a Taurian. Taurus is here. All right, this is Taurus. So the sun is essentially in Taurus, but accidentally in the seventh house because the time of birth is an accident. Why is it an accident? Well, an accident only happens once. Sorry, that was an accident. I won't do it again. Then the person, what happens if a person repeats that accident? You stood on my toe a second time. You said the first time was an accident. <laughs> that now is called a coincidence. That's a coincidence. So in law, they have three things. That's why you, you always hear a good lawyer says, for the third time, Your Honour, or a good defendant, you'll, you'll, a prosecutor, for the third time for the record, I'm innocent. Because 
The judge won't listen to you if you say it once. It's an accident. Anything that happens once is an accident. So you'll be in court and you'll say, I'm innocent, Your Honour, and he sends you to jail for 30 years. Because you were ignorant and you didn't know that you had to say it three times for the record. So the, the judge hears you say, I'm innocent, he says, oh, okay, that's an accident. It only happened once. Then you say, Your Honour, for the second time and for the record, I am innocent. And then the judge pricks his head up and he goes, oh, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. He knows the rules, better tighten my belt, watch out, the third one's coming. If he says that again, I'll lose the case and I'll lose all those bonds, all that money I'm, I'm bidding on the stock market, because that's what they do. That's what they do. It's all cash. It's all money, man. It's a bank. The court is a bank. And he's, he's, already got, he's already put his bid bonds in, and he's waiting for you to go to jail because he's gonna, they're going to milk your, your stocks on your birth certificate. So you're sitting there and you go, I'm innocent, Your Honour. For the record, the judge says, OK, that's an accident. And you say, for the second time, for the record, I'm innocent. Now you've got his attention. And he's going to try and stop you saying it the third time. You'll see him get furious, furious. Now I order you, Mr. Banashi. Oh, you'll be in contempt of court if you continue. Your Honour, for the record, for the third and final time, I'm innocent. Goodbye. <laughs> and you walk out of there. Because the third time something happens, that's called a pattern. And when you establish a pattern, You've established law. So we have, let's go back, let's wipe this out and let's make it Aries, my sun. Right. So we have the sun essentially, in essence, essential. Help me out if I'm spelling bad, guys, because I'm not. Okay, we have the sun essentially in Aries, but accidentally in the seventh house. Because, whoops, you were born at, uh, you know, 5.01 p.m. So this, these are called accidents, the houses, accidental placements. These are essential placements. So... If you had, see, my son in the seventh house is, is, a good, is, is a good accidental placement. It's better than if it's in the eighth house. <laughs> Way better. Um, and it's better than if it was in the sixth house. A lot of people, uh, they kind of get killed when their son's in the sixth house, like John Lennon, uh, Michael Jackson. Um, you know, they get themselves killed. Uh, You'll find that a lot of these famous people who have died in accidents, their son is in the sixth house. Well, you can see the sun, what happens when the sun goes, when it sets in the sixth house? It's gone down, it's bang. It's, remember we said these, these are cadent houses. And, and this axis here is the worst one in astrology, the sixth and the twelfth house. This is acute illnesses, this is chronic illnesses. This is the house of illness. This is the house of illness. You see? So, so my son in Aries is essentially dignified because it exalts in Aries and it is also accidentally dignified. So what a good astrologer does is he looks first for essential dignities. Okay, so this guy... He's got his son in Leo. That's good. That's a domicile. His son is essentially dignified. Good. Where's the moon? In Taurus, where it exalts. Good. So both luminaries are essentially dignified. Then Mars is in Capricorn, where it exalts. So Mars is essentially dignified. Whoops. Saturn's in Cancer. Detriment. So... That detriment is, is an essential detriment. It's not an essential dignity. 
Saturn is essentially detrimented. Not accidentally. If Saturn were in Cancer in the sixth house, it would be both essentially detriment and accidentally in detriment. And that's where Saturn can really cause a lot of harm. We all know that Saturn is a malefic and he's going to do, he's going to bother you in the chart. But if he's in a bad sign, essentially undignified, and in his, he's in a bad house, which is these catered ones, So we find Saturn over, uh, let's say here, Saturn's over here and is in Cancer where he's in detriment. He's essentially in detriment and accidentally in detriment. That's when you've got big trouble on your hands. That's where you know that that person is going to have all, si all kinds of things related to Cancer like the spleen, the digestion, the skin, um, stomach you, because not only is Saturn in Cancer where he's going to hurt that system of the body the digestion and the spleen etc but it is also in accidental detriment which means it's weak and you've got two detriments you've got two problems on your hands alright and then there's other things that can hurt it as well. If it's retrograding or if it's squaring, we're going to learn about aspects next, next week. Next week we'll be learning about the aspects and which ones are strong, which ones are weak, and which ones are good and which ones are bad. But let's say Saturn's in Cancer. That's an essential detriment. It's in the 12th house. That's an accidental detriment. It's squaring with Mars. That's a detriment, and it's in retrograde. Now you know you've really got to help. You see, you see these people who have had a hell of a life. They've had so much misfortune. You know, they, I don't know, maybe they're paraplegic. They've only got use of their arms, but below their waist they're in a wheelchair, let's say something like that, right? And their father died when they were four, their mother died when they were 12. Their sister's got cancer in hospital, dying. Their spouse left them, ran off with the kids for another man. And you hear these stories, you know, I've met a lot of these people. Tragic. Tragic. And then you get these people that, like, nothing's ever bothered them in life. And they're like, hey, how you going, man? And they've got a good car and a good house. And their wife's been loyal and their children are good and we're obedient and really respectable. And... Everything's nice, and they've got a lot of money, and it's, they live a long life, and it's, right? It's all this. When you go into their charts, you'll probably see that this individual has those detriments. So today, all I want to establish was these things. That you, for the next week, I want you to meditate on this line of the earth. And you see what, over the next seven days, till the next lesson, you see what that's going to produce for you. Many aha moments are going to come to you. The other thing I wanted to establish is the ecliptic. And the 24-hour clock going clockwise. We've done that. The other thing I wanted to establish is the difference between the signs and the houses. We've done that. The houses never move. First house is always here. But Aries, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, can be here. But at 7, it'll be here. At 9, it'll be here. At 11, it'll be here. The signs are going around and around and around. The houses are fixed. Okay? We've established that. The third and final, uh, the fourth and final thing I want to establish in the first lesson is about essential dignities and accidental dignities. Okay, so you have to understand that when you're looking, you know, if you're a superficial astrologer and, and someone says, oh, my son is in Aquarius, well, that's in detriment. You know, 
Already Aquarians have been disadvantaged by that. That means, you know, vitally, they are less vital than the Leo. And that's, that's a fact. All things being equal, Leos have got more vitality than Aquarians, period. Period. And Aries, according to um, Thomas H. Burgoyne, are the strongest and most physical and athletic of all the signs, all things being equal. Because you might have a, an Aryan brother or sister and they might be really so... Because other things are happening in their chart. But the fact that they were born in Aries, they were blessed to have vitality. Aries and Leo have a lot of, and Sagittarius, the fire signs especially, they have a lot of vitality because the sun thrives in those signs. So if you're a superficial astrologer and, you know, um, sun, you hear of someone who has a sun in Aquarius and a moon in, say, Capricorn, opposite Cancer, where it's in detriment, um, you might automatically think that they're, they're cursed, you know, and they're going to have bad luck. But, but those... Depends on the time they're born, because what, what if accidentally that sun is in the first house? Well, see, accidentally the sun has been picked up now. You see, the sun may be in, in Aquarius, it's not good, essentially not good, but the accidental placement picks it up, levels it out. So don't automatically think, oh, when someone says, um, oh, my moon's in Scorpio, and you think, oh, oh gee, oh, they're going to have so many problems with desire and lust and addictions, and uh, they're going to be controlling and emotional and intense. No, no, don't, don't, don't do that. That's, that is a condition of a moon in Taurus, yes. But what if the moon is in a beautiful house like this, like the 5th or the 11th? What if the moon in Scorpio is in the 5th house? Because remember, the, well, not remember because I haven't taught you yet, but this is the worst axis. This is evil. This is the best. Luck, fortune, health, prosperity, all kinds of good things happen when people have in when people have a lot of planets in the fifth and the sixth house. So you might the person you're talking to might have a moon in Scorpio and you th you're thinking, "Oh man, that's bad, bad, bad." But it's in the it's in the fifth house. So now it's it's leveled out. And they won't have as many of those problems. They won't. They'll have them. They'll be there underlying, but they won't be as intense. They won't have as much other negative and disastrous consequences associated with it because it's accidentally in a good house. So that's what that's what I want to establish, guys. I wanted to establish now the difference between the signs and the houses. The signs are, have elements, fire, earth, air and water, so that's essence. My sun is in Aries, so the essence of my sun is fire. But my sun is in the seventh house, so accidentally I'm interested in other people, astrology, health, divination, spiritual science and others. And well, haven't I got a channel where I'm teaching everyone in the world about spiritual science? That shows I'm not. That shows that I've got seven plants, uh, six plants in the seventh house, interested in others, doesn't it? And astrology, because it's the house of astrology, spiritual science, philosophy, divination. All right. Yep. So is the fifth house just for Sagittarius and Scorpio, or can it be other signs? That no, 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 because the signs are always turning, and oh, okay. Marie, right? So the, the signs, no. But it, what it does relate to is the fifth sign, Leo. Okay. Always, always. So 
the first house relates to Aries, but Aries won't always be here. Because remember, everything, the, the zodiac, the, 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 the signs, not the houses, they're fixed. The signs are never fixed, they're always moving. They're moving 15, 15 degrees every hour, 15 degrees every hour, 15 degrees every hour. That's how much they move every hour, the signs and the planets on the ecliptic in the signs. I wish I had a board. I'm going to get someone to make me a board so I can do that, so I can rotate this oh, yeah. around and keep the houses inside fixed oh, and then have a magnet um, planets on, on them. And I'm going to get it made. I'm talking to someone right now about that. So I'm going to be able to do this really, really well, guys. You know, if I had the equipment, I'd, I'd, I'd probably have... Had, would have squeezed two lessons instead of um, in, in, one, in these, these two hours rather than, than one if I had the right equipment because it's so hard to do when you have to keep wiping the board. But no, so someone just asked here that because I said that Scorpio was in the fifth house, is, is that related to... No, because remember, it's not related to the fifth house. In that person's chart it was because that was the time they were born. But Scorpio and all the signs are always moving. Always. It's random. This is random. This is not. This is not. This is always fixed, the houses. The first house is your personality, your money, your brothers and sisters, your home life, your pleasure and children and fortune. Ill health, partners, death and transformation, travel, and um, the gods and the higher mind, career, public life, social life, private life, and chronic illness. So that's always fixed, 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 never, ever, 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 ever moves. It cannot move. These are always moving. 15 degrees every hour, the zodiac signs, with the planets on the ecliptic. So you can add the ecliptic, this and all of this are stuck together. This is all, the, the planets on the ecliptic, they're always going around. Always going around clock clockwise, and the signs that they're in behind them, this zodiac belt, with them, that's always moving, always, okay? That's why you need to know the time of an individual's birth. Now what I'll do is, before we get some question and answers, I've really gone way over time, I'm going to share my screen and show you that. Please, please, please watch my screen, everybody, right now, if you want to really, really understand what's going on. This will leap you forward in astrology, leaps and bounds. Let's, let's look at this at real time, what I've been explaining to you. All right, let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this thing here. Where are my glasses? I need my $2 glasses. I'm going blind. 20 years of 10 hours a day on the computer kind of does that to you. But I tell you, with the protocols I do, I'm keeping, I'm keeping them going. You need to get some of those Tesla wear glasses. Tesla ones? Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, this right now is where you need to focus. What I will do, what I will do is give you this website. Let's get you this website right now, astrotheme.com. I'm going to give you two websites. I'll put it in the chat, the chit chat. Bang, copy that. Put it in your favourites. Right now. <laughs> Bossy me. And I wonder whether... Um, how do I go to Astro? I think I've got to do this. I've got to get rid of all this stuff here. Let's 
get rid of all this. Bang, 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 bang. I think I've got to give you this, astro.com. All right, and please, we're going to work with these two um, websites, all right? Now, let's go back to Astro theme. When you come to this Astro theme, guys, click on this. Click on this small wheel over here and make it big. All right. Now, the beauty of this one is, see up here you've got this uh, browsing. You can go forward in time and backward in time. So let's do what, uh, one hour slots. Let's go, I'm going to hit this button forward an hour. Watch where the sun is. This is the time right now here in Cancun. Look where the sun is. We are in just south of Cancun and the sun, it's, it's um, now this is New York time. We're at four o'clock, so it's four o'clock. But in New York right now, in uh, Eastern Standard Time, it is five o'clock. And this is where the sun is. You, can you see how it's a 24 hour clock? We already told you, what's the MC, please? Thank you. What's the uh, DC over here? Thank you. What's the IC over here? 12 a.m. What's the AC over here? 6 a.m. Thank you. All right. So if this is tw roughly 12 over here, we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, and look, roughly it's 5 o'clock. Okay? The sun's going to be setting later. It's going to be setting at about, um, let's see what time the sun sets in New York. I know it sets about 8 o'clock over here, New York. What time does the sun set in New York? About, yeah, 8.30. 8 okay. That's why the sun's so high. So it's not always... Remember, this here, this point here, the DC, it's not always 6 p.m. We just want you to think of this... You just need to think of this as a 24-hour clock because that's what it is. But, you see, over here in Cancun, the sun rises at 6.05 in the morning but sets at... 30. Well, what goes on with that? We can explain that. You'd be thinking, hang on, shouldn't it be rising at the same time as it sets? Why is it setting so late? Right? It should be more even, right? No, that's not how it works. We'll explain all that. So let's, let's go forward one hour. I'm going to click this right now. Watch the sun. See where the sun is? Make a note of where the sun is. Perhaps even, um, you know, screenshot it. Here we go. I'm going to click. See where the sun is now? I'm going to click another hour. I'm going to click another hour. Check out the time, New York, 8 o'clock. Remember we said 8.30 it sets? Look, it's nearly setting at 8 o'clock. Let's go to 9 o'clock. Night time. The sun is under the earth. Remember, the earth is the line that extends horizontally forever. The sun does not literally go under the earth. Click again. Watch the sun and all the planets. Watch all the planets. Look at the moon right ascending right now. The moon is ascending at 10 o'clock in New York. At night, the moon is going to rise. So if you're living in New York or anywhere in the US of A, at 10 o'clock, go out and you will see the moon will rise in the east. That's tonight. Even here in Puerto Morelos, wherever you are, 10 o'clock, the moon is going to be rising. Let's go forward. Look at the moon now. Look where the sun is. They're opposite each other. Remember, it was a full moon in Sagittarius two days ago. And now the moon's in Capricorn, but you can see they're opposite each other. Keep watching the sun and the moon. Another hour. Here we go. Can you see now? I'm just going to keep clicking. I'm going to go one hour slots. Watch the, all the planets, guys. Watch everything move. You see? Now, now, in this system, they've got the house, the houses on the outside. So here, this, see number one over here? That's the first house. 
okay? That's the first house, second house, third house. It doesn't matter, you can have it on the inside like this system has it, right? I prefer this. It doesn't matter. The thing is, the first house will always be here. But you see, the signs... Okay, are you watching the signs as well? Watch the sun in Gemini. See, the sun is just about to exit Gemini. It's right near the cusp of Cancer. So in three days, four days' time, we are going to... Five days' time, we're going to have a solstice. When the sun hits this cusp of Cancer... But just watch it in Gemini. I'm going forward. Forward I go. It's 10 o'clock in the morning in New York tomorrow. 11 o'clock in New York tomorrow. Midday, New York tomorrow. Watch the sun and the moon. All the planets and all the signs. They're all going around clockwise. Alright? So, click on the link, go into Astro Theme and do this yourself. Just do it. Go backwards, go forwards, just do it and watch how all those planets move and understand how that daily clockwise rotation is a 24-hour clock. Okay? Back to where we started. All right. Okay, guys, let's have some questions. Who's first? Come on, Nick, you're usually first. You're a bit slow off the... Where's Nick? I'm over here. Yeah. Uh, Nothing to say? I I I'm sorry? No questions? No, nothing is understood perfectly. Like, I wish I had something. Okay. Nick, it's Kitsano. How you going, bro? Hey, Crystal. How's it going? Good. Oh, nice and cold in Minnesota? No, it's pretty warm now. Yeah. Good, good. Well, sun's in Gemini Cancer. It's summer's coming. Yeah, it's going to be uh, 101 um, in like five days. Yeah. Because yep. it'll be on the Tropic of Cancer. <laughs> it, it is roasting here, man. We've got the air conditioner on in this studio and it's still hot. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what did you enjoy about today? What did you learn? What questions do you have? Maybe anyone, if you want to jump in. I've got a question. Okay. It's Julia here from Liverpool. Hi. Hey, Julia. Um, hi. <laughs> um, just really curious, so that the... I've had a little bit of a, an awareness today, so thank you for explaining it really for the first time ever. Um, who came up with the the houses, you know, and the, the sort of the areas and, you know, where did that all come from? Okay, you know? good question. So the 12 houses, yeah. To understand this, you must understand waves. Okay. Mm -hmm. Every wave has a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. Everything is waves. There's nothing but waves vibrating. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Everything you see, even on your computer, the screen, you're, you're looking at my face, but it's mm -hmm. only zeros and ones waving. Mm -hmm. Where every wave of energy, where energy starts, that has a certain dynamic and archetypal mm -hmm. indicator denominator. Wherever a wave begins, that portion of the wave always indicates beginning, freshness, newness, starting. So, no one invented this. Mm. This is just wave science. So, we, we know with our intelligence that the first part of the wave, you see, this is the point where your chart begins, where you begin to read a chart, because this is the point, this energy under the earth is coming up and everything starts here, right here. That is the beginning point of everything. So that portion of the wave, of every wave, indicates the nature of the wave or the individual that owns that wave. 
This part of the wave indicates what he has. This is who he is. Mm. This always, this part of every wave indicates what it has, what power Mm. it has. Power to make money, power to... This always tells the story of how it communicates. Here is where you learn the communication style of the individual and his brothers and sisters, because that's you, that's someone else, and now that's that's Adam and Eve, uh, Aries and and Taurus, and here is Gemini, the twins, your brothers. Mm. Right? Then cancer is your home. The crab lives in the home. But, But... it's that portion of the wave, wave yeah. the fourth portion of every wave, tells you how that individual who owns that wave is housed, how his foundation is, because it's the number four. It's the fourth part of the wave. So now we have a, a real area, we have a space, we have an area, mm. and we have... Um, like the foundations yeah it's exactly okay so like four pillars almost yes. as you just described that yeah okay, okay because because the cube now is now uh space because it's 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 got four points so it tells you about the number four speaks of your foundation which is your home the number five the fifth part of every wave is the part where the heart comes in, the pleasure, the way they enjoy their lives, the style of enjoyment. And that is, it's the same in a movie. Mm -hmm. The first part is always telling you about Mm -hmm. the individuals involved, their personalities, and then what they have, and then they communicate with people, and then, you know, it's... They all follow the zodiac. Every script, every drama, every opera, every speech, every cosmology, mythology, gospel, legend, poem, all have a beginning point. And they always have the same kind of introduction. They introduce themselves. I am... I have... I'm speaking... Right... Then they establish their foundation, and then they show their pleasure, then they show their um, service to others and, and how uh, interested they are in self-improvement. Then they show uh, service to others. Oh, this is service to others. This is more interest in others where you um, interact with others, then they show their creative skills, then they show their higher mind, then they show their, their life path, then they show their social behaviour, then their private life, and then everything, everything's finished and tells the whole story. Mm. But not every house has just one meaning. You know, mm. if you go into your browser and you do uh, astrological put in the words astrological houses and you'll see hundreds of them and they'll show you the first house the simple ones let, let me show you an example let's do it so astrological this is what you do at home astrological houses okay do that oh, am I sharing Right, I'm sharing now, right? See what I put in here? Astrological houses. Two words. Okay? Alright. So, images. Alright. So, let's grab a simple one. Here we go. Let's grab this simple one. Look at that. Self identity. So they've only got one item, Mm. possessions, 
communication, home, creativity. So they've only got a few things. Now let's go to this one. Now why has this one got a whole bunch of stuff? And, and this, this, even this is limited. Because mm. I can put a hundred things in the first house. The self, the appearance. Remember I said the rising sign gives you your appearance. Mine is Leo. Beginnings. Ah. Oh no, hey, can you? My delivery? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, dude. Yeah. Sí, espera. Estoy llegando. Dame dos minutos. Winding her up. That'll cover everything. Uh, yeah, I'll just wait for anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Oh. They used to come at seven. Now, now they're coming at four. All right. Um, the body, first impressions, attitude, identity, approach to life. So look at this. See, the, the beginning of every wave, this is the, the archetypal indicator right there. You can never, ever, ever take all of these things and move them to the second house. It won't work because wave theory does not work, work like this. This is simple wave theory. Now look what they've done here. This is, this is good because this is how I do my charts. Um, they've actually put Aries in the first house. Yeah, you see? Because why? Because Aries is I am. Taurus is I have. Gemini is I think. So how you communicate, how you think. Right, so you can see that the sign actually corresponds with the house. But don't confuse signs with houses. That's what I get a bit confused with. But well, that's because I'm just new, that's all. That's right. I just we're, need to we're kind we're of distinguish that. the two. Right, we're going to sort that out. A different, yeah. That's just because I'm, I'm a newbie, that's all. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll sort that out. <laughs> all right. Who else would like to say something? Nick? Yeah. Thomas, I was, so at any point during this series, are you just going to make the connection between scripture as well? Like we have the four angles as well as the four archangels? Yeah, of course. Of always. Right. Theology, this is theology. Mm. It's astro theology and astrology, which means it is theology. So, of course, yes. We're going to learn that Jupiter is Jupiter Zeus, Jesus. We're going to learn yeah. that Saturn is Satan. That's why he's the malefic. You see? We're going to learn these beautiful things, guys. Just remember, the difference between the signs in the houses is the signs are always moving, essentially, but the houses are always fixed. It should be... It's funny because it's, it should be flipped over. If, if something is moving, then that should be accidental. Right? The houses should be essential, but it's it doesn't work that way because, because, because they're fixed and the signs are moving, right? Then the time your birth born only happens once. Anything that happens once is an accident. It doesn't mean usually we associate accidents with bad things. An accident has to be tragic or horrible. No, there's beautiful accidents. You know, you have great accidents, like you meet someone in the street that you haven't seen for a while. You know, that only happened once in your life, and that's an accident. That's a good thing. It's a good accident. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the difference between essential dignities and accidental dignities. Very important, because if you're an acute astrologer, you will look for that. You won't jump to conclusions if you see... Um, you know, Mars in, in uh, Libra, right? I always, when, whenever I see Mars in Libra, I've seen so many. One of the worst things that can happen in, in astrology in Australia is having Mars in Libra. 
But not always. Depends on the accidental position. Which house is Mars in? Because Mars in Libra means this. Essentially it means this. Libra is about judgment and harmony and balance and justice and fairness. Mars is burning too much, is overzealous. So the individual you know is going to be making rash judgments. You know they're going to be judgmental. You know they're going to be harsh, perhaps. Because they're, they're not... Mars falls... Uh, is, sorry, is in detriment in Libra. So he's a naughty boy in Libra. He, he shouldn't be in there. You don't want him in there. But that all depends. Because if you want to be a badass in the career and accidentally in the 10th house, well then, you know, it doesn't matter. You can make bad, ju ju bad judgments in your career, but you're going to be heroic, so ultimately you'll be, you know, you'll be the victor. Um, but it depends if it's in an, an angle or a succinct house or a cadent house, different types of house, depends where it is accidentally as well and other things. Is it aspecting badly like a square or an opposition to another planet? Is it retrograding? You know, there's a lot of things to consider. You don't just look at one thing. A doctor who you know, um, sees a patient with a, a runny nose and suddenly just quickly says, right, you've got the flu. All right, it might be an allergy. You need this, that, headaches, you need congested chest, you need dizziness, you need a bit of vomiting or whatever. You need 10 things to diagnose a flu. You don't make a diagnosis on one, uh, on one item, you know, on one indic indicator. So you'd be a bad doctor. So you don't want to be a bad astrologer. So that's why I've established first things first. What is essentially good and what is accidentally good or bad. Those are the things you have to train your eye to see in astrology. And then even when you've established that, still you need to look further. You need to, you need to go even deeper. Because the next thing you look at is aspects. The first thing astrology looks for is essential dignities. Are the planets in good signs? The second thing an astrologer looks for is uh, accidental dignities. Are the planets in good houses? The third thing is aspects. Are they aspecting and being helped or hurt by other planets? The fourth thing is incidentals, like retrograde. Um, applying to a planet or drawing away from a planet. We'll learn what that is. So, but let's keep it simple. To, if it's retrograding, we know that that's got naughty things attached to it. Something not good. Well, it's, it's a repeat. It's karmic. So, so that'll be the fourth thing they look for. All right? Then the other thing is, the fifth thing I would say would be night chart or a day chart. See, if you've got, if you were born with your sun above this line, you belong to the day sect. The day sect. If you were born with your sun below that line, You've got the night night sect. Okay? So I'm a diurnal. I was born when the sun when it was daytime. I wasn't born at night. Now that also is going to condition your chart. How so? If you were born at night, your rising sign over here, let's say you've got a Sagittarius rising sign. It's going to be stronger than your sun sign in your look. Because the way you look is a mixture of your sun sign and your rising sign. Mine is Aries and Leo. So because my sun was above the line of the earth when I was born, it was over here, 
Now Aries is stronger. I've got a stronger Aryan look than I have a Leo look. There's more Aryan features in me. But if I were born at night, let's say at 7 p.m., two hours later, let's say my mother was in labour for an extra two hours, I was born at night, then, well, I wouldn't have a Leo rising, I would have a Virgo rising for a start, and then I would look more Virgo than Aryan. So all you people who are born at night, your rising sign is showing stronger than all you persons who were born during the day. So that's why sometimes when people say, oh, Santos, guess my sun sign. And I say, Sagittarius. And they go, nah, I got you. I'm a Scorpio. And I say, all right, let me do your chart. And I do the chart and I see that they were born at night and their rising sign was Sagittarius and I was right. And usually, I'm 90% on the money, you know. So, you know, so guessing people's sign is tricky, depending on whether they're born at night. The first thing you should ask them is, were you born during the day or at night? Find that out first before you start guessing, okay? <laughs> And, and the night people are different. They're more inclined to be introspective. They're more inclined to be content in the private life. They're more inclined to be... Um, oh, I forget the words. It's right on the tip of my tongue. People born during the day, generally they're more... Um, uh, Intro, excess, what's the word I'm looking for? Extroverted. Extroverted. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can't blame it on the cannabis either because I didn't have any today. Uh, yeah. it's just, <laughs> I don't know. Extrovert, um, you know, more sort of, some, sometimes it relates to vitality as well. They're more vital. People born at night can be less vital. Yes, that's something to look at as well. You, the, the vitality of the individual, all things being equal. Let's say everything is equal in everybody's charts, and you get half the people that were half the people were born by day and half were at night. Guaranteed, guaranteed, these people will be more vital and healthy than the people born at night. Simple. All things being equal. Okay. Remember that expression, all things being equal, because you don't ever make an assessment on someone's chart by looking at one thing. I don't like it when people say, what's your sun sign? Aries. Oh, 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 oh you're Aries, are you? Oh, 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 oh. And that because they don't like all their Aries brother, their Aries mother, their Aries friend, they always argue with Aries, so that makes you bad. No. All things being equal, <laughs> see, you can't just ask someone their sun sign. You've got to know their moon, where the planets are, whether they're born by night or by day. You've got to know a whole bunch of things before you know anything about them. Knowing their sun sign only tells you one thing. It only tells you what they are like in the private, in their higher self what their high, highest ideals are. That's the only thing that it will tell you. Then you've got to put everything else together by the rest of their chart, their moon, etc., etc. Et All right, guys, we've come to the end, so not even any time for um, question and answers, really. I mean, uh, more participation. Hope you enjoyed it, and that's the foundation. The line of the earth. The ecliptic, never forget the ecliptic. The signs are always going around the 24-hour clock and the houses are fixed. The planet in a sign is an essential attribute. The planet in a house is an accidental attribute. Thank you very much. <laughs>